Hello, everyone. A very good afternoon to those who are joining us from Singapore and Asia, and good morning or good evening to all of you joining us from other parts of the world. Thank you for being here with us for today's online event on Deep Tech for a Post-COVID World, Making Travel Safe Again, presented by SG Innovate, IBM, and Accredify, partnered with the Singapore Management University's Blockchain Club and in support of Deep Tech for Good. My name is Jin from SG Innovate, and as a Singapore government-backed investor, we have been building up and driving deep tech innovations in AI, healthcare, quantum tech, food and agri-tech, and autonomous technologies across various industries. At SG Innovate, much of our work is to connect Singapore with the global deep tech ecosystem to learn how we can better harness technology. Today, we have a panel of experts and thought leaders to discuss some of the challenges and possible solutions to address the biggest question on almost all our minds, when and how we can travel safely again. Throughout the session, we encourage you to engage with our speakers by submitting your questions in the Q&A box located on the lower panel of your screen. So without further ado, I would like to invite our moderator for this discussion, Simon, to start us off. Simon, please. Thank you, Jen. What a cool video to start off this event. Uh, so welcome uh, to, to all the audience. Thank you for, for, for joining us today. And a big thank you uh, to the panelists, uh, to Vijay, uh, Rizwan, Christine, and Zhang Wei. Uh, before uh, introductions and this sort of thing, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, as Jin said, uh, we, we really like uh, uh, the audience to ask some questions. So there is this Q&A uh, box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them in there. They'll come through to me um, and I can, uh, I can weave them into, into the discussion that we're having today. I'll, I'll, I'll try my absolute best to get to everything that, that everyone asks um, as we go along. So with, with that done, um, I think uh, let's start off with some introductions. Uh, I don't think uh, I, I can do justice to, to the panelists. So, uh, so I'll, I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Um, BJ, maybe, maybe we can start with you. Thank you, Simon. And thank you, Jen. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Pleasure to join this panel. My name is Vijay Anand. I lead travel and transportation industries in IBM across Asia Pacific, Greater China, Japan, the Middle East, Africa geographies. So firstly, thanks to SG Innovate, Accredify, SMU, and my colleagues in IBM for organizing this panel. Pleasure to meet with my fellow panelists as well for the first time today, actually, right? So I'm looking forward to this panel. I have been focused uh, across all segments of the global travel and transportation industries over the last 30 years. Here's a little secret for you. I personally earned a new platinum elite loyalty status at my home, like all of you, having stayed 365 days in one location since March last year <laughs> for the first time in 30 years. So the number of trips to the supermarket helped as well. Back to you, Simon. Thanks, VJ. I think I can join you in that club. Uh, first, first elite status I have, I think. Uh, Christine, uh, welcome from Berlin, right? Yes, thank you so much. Um, so maybe just a quick couple of words about myself. I'm the managing director of Lufthansa Innovation Hub, and we actually look at the entire travel chain. So how people and cargo actually goes from A to B, and we look into travel mobility tech. So looking at new business uh, uh, business models and new value propositions that arise. Um, so very much complementary to the aviation industry. And we're, we consider ourselves as the connector between the Lufthansa Group, one of the major airlines uh, in Europe, as well as the startup ecosystem. Fantastic to have you on. Uh, and Rizwan? Hi. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, thank you, Simon, for inviting me to this, uh, to this uh, very distinguished uh, uh, you know, uh, session, which uh, involves very distinguished panelists. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, OK. so. Uh, my name is Rizwan Hazarika, but, uh, you know, uh, most people call me Riz, so uh, I'd be happy if the panelists call me Riz, they can address me as Riz. Uh, so I uh, come from uh, Singex Sphere Holdings, and I'm not sure if everyone here in the, uh, everyone uh, of, of you, the attendees here are, really know what we do. Uh, but uh, we are um, essentially the, uh, for those of you who are from Singapore, you probably know of Singapore Expo. So we are the managers of Singapore Expo. I represent the mice industry. So in that sense, I'm not so much travel, but I'm an extension of the travel ecosystem. 
right? And our industry is very closely related to travel. Uh, so uh, we actually run two lines of business. The first one, as I mentioned, is Singapore Expo. So we manage that facility here. It is actually Singapore's uh, uh, largest purpose-built MICE facility. Uh, we are also an event organizer uh, and we're involved with uh, some, uh, some of Singapore's and actually uh, uh, you know, so some, some very global marquee events like the Singapore FinTech Festival. Uh, and then a whole bunch of events that cut across uh, tech and uh, innovation sectors. Uh, so uh, look after pretty much all of digital and technology. Uh, in the uh, last two years, we have been spending a lot of time in transforming the business. So once again, happy to be here. And we're happy to have you on. Thank you, Riz. Uh, congratulations on the Connect the Changi uh, project again. I, I think it's a, a wonderful um, uh, uh, project and, and an opportune project uh, current, considering the current kind of climate we're in and, and hopefully we can spend some time on that. Uh, welcome, Zhang Wei as well. Hey, thanks, Simon. And thanks, Vijay. Thanks, Rizwan. Thanks, Chris, Dean, for joining us here. Um, I'm the CEO of Accredify and the co-founder. So Accredify is the bridge for secure healthcare data sharing. And then we are also working on a digital health passport you know, some of our partners like IBM is right here and SG Innovates, basically to reopen the different economies through the use of digital credentials. Um, throughout the session, I'll be sharing a little bit more. So uh, I'm not going to share too much now. Uh, back to you, Simon. Okay, thank you for joining us, Zhang Wei. So uh, I guess uh, let me paint a little bit of a picture uh, of COVID and then uh, I don't want to do too, so much talking, right? Uh, so I I'm going to... Uh, ask a, a couple of our panelists to join me in this. But to start off with, I think uh, it's about a year since the, uh, the WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic. And, and during that time, we've, we've seen a lot of uh, terrible things, I guess. We've seen 120 million confirmed infections. We've seen uh, over 2.6 million confirmed deaths. Um, and, and there's probably you know, a huge amount of uh, unseen impact as well from the pandemic. Um, it wouldn't be a stretch, I think, to, to argue that we'll have a whole generation of healthcare workers, you know, with some variation of, of, of PTSD or, or something like this. And, uh, and I think probably, again, fair to argue that uh, with, a, with a disease that uh, so badly impacts an individual's uh, organs that it, it wouldn't be unsurprising to see a huge uptick in, in chronic diseases uh, as in, in, in the kind of long term. And, and you know, if we had this, it's going to have huge impacts on, on healthcare systems all around the world. Um, but, and, you know, I think we're seeing a little bit of a light now. Uh, last, week, last week, I heard an incredible stat um, that it's been uh, just a little bit over 90 days or, or three months since the first vaccine was approved by the first country. Uh, and in that time, since, since, since that 90 days, we've had over 400 million vaccinations. And I, I think that's incredible. Uh, it's such a cool stat. Um, COVID-19 has really brought uh, a, lot of, a lot of the world together in this incredible kind of logistical and scientific drive. Um, and, and perhaps we're past the peak. Um, you know, no doubt, I think there'll be twists in this tale still to come. Um, you know, for example, variants could be a, a huge risk factor for, for recovery. But I think it would be prudent to, for us to start thinking about the, the type of world that we're moving into, right? If we have passed this peak, what does this world look like? Um, we, we see these kind of uh, travel bubbles being announced, uh, I think just week, just this week, Singapore government and Australian government came out and said they're targeting July um, to open up a, a bubble for vaccinated individuals. And we see, you know, maybe this being uh, other countries like uh, Taiwan and uh, South Korea, New Zealand being earmarked to join these sort of things. And, and that's just one example. I'm sure different countries and different regions all around the world will start looking to, to see how they can safely open up. And today's event, I guess, is all around the technology, the deep tech that can really drive this uh, and allow people to do it safely so that we can restart these massive industries, the, the airline industry, the, the mice industry, and, and, and literal economies in countries that are you know, so reliant on, on, on tourism um, and, 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 and business travel and all the rest that goes with this. So I think with, with, that, kind of, uh, with that kind of scene set for me, I would like to pass to VJ. Uh, VJ, you have this incredible um, perspective, I guess, across a lot of 
different airlines and travel partners that you work with. Can you share with the audience, I guess, uh, the impacts that COVID-19 has had on the industry? Sure, Simon. Uh, thank you for the brief before. Now, I fully agree that recovery is in sight, but it's also important to look at the impact of COVID, specifically on the aviation travel tourism industry. So as some of you know, ICAO, which is International Civil Aviation Organization, released their economic impact analysis just last week. And they worked together with various industry bodies like IATA, ACI, uh, WTTC, UNWTO, and others as well. So compared to 2019, there was an overall reduction of 50% of the seats that the airlines offered last year in 2020. And the overall reduction was close enough to 2.7 billion passengers, which is roughly a reduction of 60 to 70% worldwide last year. And that translates to a loss of revenue of $370 billion on the passenger side of revenue for airlines. And if you break that down, it's roughly about 250 billion in the international routes and another 120 billion on the domestic routes. Now these numbers I know by heart because we've been going through this over the last many months with several airlines and the industry bodies. This is a huge, huge impact. Now to give you a perspective, Southwest Airlines CEO, last night on a press interview, he mentioned that they probably raised uh, close to 20 years of financing the capital in just 90 days, including the funding from government. So you can imagine, you know, 20 years of financing in 90 days, right? So this is only the airline industry that I talked about. So if you look at the airports, you know, airports, of course, are a close partner to airlines and they lost about over $110 billion in revenue in 2020. And that's the figures we received from Airport Council International, whom we work with closely as well. In addition to that, the tourism revenues, I think you had this on your website as well for this panel. Now the tourism industry lost over $1.3 trillion in 2020. You know, if you compare that to 19, uh, 2019, we made about $1.5 trillion in the tourism industry. And this is because almost close enough to 100% of worldwide destinations mostly were shut down last year. And these figures came from UNWTO, which is the United Nations World Tourism Organization, right? And, and close enough to about 800 million uh, tourists got shut down because of COVID. Um, also, if you look at some other perspective on this, Sirium, which is one of our global aviation data firms and partners as well, they actually came out with a, with a study that actually showed that close to 21 years of growth on the global passenger traffic was just completely wiped out in just a matter of months last year. So that reduced the global traffic to 1999 levels. So can you imagine that 21 years of global traffic gone, right? So at the peak of disruption, when we had the pandemic uh, last year in around the April timeframe, there was about 13,000 flights operating every single day. On a good day, we operate about 95,000 flights. That's an 85% reduction. So this is just a huge impact to, to our industry. Now that's only from a revenue perspective, operations perspective and others. So the, the other challenge, we need to look at all the soft impacts as well into the industry. So if you go to any of the websites from various governments or the CDC, like the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention or the health ministries from various governments worldwide, they are basically, you know, even today they have it on their website saying travel increases your chance of spreading and getting COVID-19. So they basically advise everyone to delay any non-essential travel, which is good. But they also say delay travel and stay at home to protect yourself, even if you're vaccinated. Right? These, these are going to continue to impact to revive travel for us in the industry. So the airlines need to constantly educate travelers so that they are confident to travel again. For example, the same CDC and government ministries worldwide also acknowledge that these viruses are not easily spread on board the plane or inside the aircraft because of how the air is circulated or filtered inside the airplane. But that message is not clear enough outside. So mm -hmm. I think to, to sum this up, travelers need to be constantly assured that they'll be taken care of at all times. 
and the airline airports are all committed for safety and cleanliness as a first step. And, and everyone needs to be assured that it is safe to board a plane and all passengers on board are tested and they are tested COVID negative. So mm. we really need to bring back the trust element to revive travel. So clearly this is the major impact on aviation, travel, tourism, industry, uh, and, and it's very huge. It's, it's absolutely staggering. Um, though, though, like It is just such a massive impact that the whole industry wouldn't have seen before. I imagine it would eclipse the impact from, from 9-11 many, many times over. Uh, absolutely staggering. That, the stat about winding travel back uh, 21 years is something else. So thank you very much, Vijay. Incredibly insightful. Uh, Riz, I, I think you have this, this kind of other role that, that is very travel centric, travel adjacent. I, I'm not sure how to word it, but it, you know, MICE is uh, so intertwined with travel. And, and I think you know, the, the Singapore model is, is max intertwined with travel, right? What's the kind of impact been on your industry? Yeah. Um... So, by the way, I was also looking at the chat box and I saw a similar question coming. So, it's, it's, it's very timely. I'll, I'll uh, <coughs> try, try to uh, answer, answer your question and the one in the, in the, in the chat box together. Great. I mean, okay. I can just log yeah, off yeah. soon, Rizwa. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. So, let me, uh, let me first start by saying that uh, if you really think about where uh, the mice industry is right now, right, the, the, uh, the pandemic has has literally it's been a huge impact right it has literally disrupted our business right so i don't think there's any mice company out there uh that has not felt the impact the the you know a, a profound impact uh from the pandemic situation you know uh you know pretty much from last year and then going into uh, this year and the jury is still out so we don't know how long this will continue uh so so what that means for us is uh that we had to go through a lot of soul searching especially last year, right? Uh, so travel, obviously, you know, directly impacts our business, right? We've always been in the, uh, in, in the business of uh, bringing in large groups of attendees into Singapore. Uh, we've also been in the business of facilitating uh, events across multiple geographies. So there's always travel involved in the process, right? People move from one place to the other with, with our events, right? Uh, as, as we organize them across different geographies, right? Uh, so, so, so for us, what we did last year as part of the soul searching is that we, uh, we really didn't have an option, but we used the opportunity to pivot our business. And we, we, we went through a very accelerated pace of really reconfiguring our business model. So as we speak today in hindsight, right, our business model has evolved from being a, a purely physical events type of a model to, uh, to one that we are now increasingly calling a hybrid event model, right? And again, if you go from one uh, company uh, to another in our industry, there are different ways and means of describing a hybrid. Uh, but for us at this point in time, a hybrid model essentially means that both the, the physical and the ability to connect audiences through many different virtual formats is all intertwined. And it, it goes hand in hand, right? Uh, and I think what we are very clear about at this point in time uh, is that uh, as, as, the, as, as, as this situation evolves and we don't know which way it's going to go, uh, uh, we will see, uh, we will surely see a shift in the way events are organized in the future, right? They're not going to be the same anymore, right? So we will have at some point when things improve, when we are beyond this pandemic and we move into what is so-called the post-pandemic world, we will see again the return of travel and therefore a lot of uh, physical attendance to events, uh, but we, we we don't see a, a, a virtual or a digital type of an environment going away, right? Uh, as as we as we move forward, and and the reason for that I think is as we look back, right? Uh, uh, the, the 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 virtual formats and the virtual environments have created many new opportunities for attendees to connect, and a great example is the one that we're doing today, right? Uh, so they've, they've created many, many uh, new forms of connections, new ways of engaging with audiences, new ways of collecting data. And again, going back to the point of deep tech, right? And as we're collecting all of this data, we're now realizing that we're learning way more about our attendees, you know, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. They are exhibitors, they are sponsors, they are, you know, visitors, delegates, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that then we knew about them before. 
And therefore, what this is doing is it is giving us new ways of learning about them and engaging them through both virtual and digital formats, right? Uh, so, so in other words, if you really think about it, yeah, we're in the virtual travel world now, <laughs> right? For lack of a better word. And, and that is really the, this, this whole hybrid model, right? So, uh, uh, so, so yeah, it's been, it's been a great uh, uh, process of learning. Uh, the, the, the learning doesn't stop right now. It will continue for a few more years. Uh, and uh, we just use this as an opportunity to create new ways of engagement, right? That, that's, that's where we are. Uh, and as travel returns, I think what this will do for us is with all this learning and with the assumption that things may go back to some sort of normalcy, with all this learning uh, and this, uh, this, these, these new insights that we are gathering, we will most probably be able to create many more innovative ways of running, organizing, and managing events, which were not possible earlier. Right. Mm. Uh, so, so that that's what we're really taking out of all of this right now. That that's our perspective in the mice industry, right? Uh, and maybe I'd add another point here. So this, the, the so the, the the conversation that I've had right now is about an event organizer's lens, right? About organizing events. But there's also another lens. There is a lens of operating and running a venue, which we do here, where in, in Singapore, right? Which is Singapore Expo. And as a as an as a, as a venue operator. Uh, because of the restrictions that we have right now, right, uh, uh, in, in place, in, uh, 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 there are constraints on the number of attendees that we can bring into a venue and the kind of events that we can actually host, right? Uh, what, what, again, this opportunity has done for, and I call it an opportunity, has, has done for us last year is that it has created new ways and means to keep our attendees safe and secure at all points in time when we the event, right? Uh, and therefore, what this also means is that there are many different opportunities to connect with ecosystem partners. For example, you know, with uh, Christine here, happy to hear her views with airlines, uh, with partners in the hotel industry, and to ensure that when more and more of our attendees, whether be they consumers or business attendees, come to Singapore, they feel safe and secure at each point of that value chain. You know, from that moment that they land, from the, uh, the uh, from when they deplane at the airport and then they check in and arrive here at the venue, right? And again, I think you just made a point when we started the conversation about Connected Changi. Connected Changi is again that unique experiment of really, you know, in other words, you can think of it as another very futuristic hybrid model, right? Because what we're doing here is that we have created a, 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 a comfort zone for, uh, for visitors from all over the world to very safely and securely transact and do their business. Right? And it starts right from the time that they land at, the, at Changi Airport, uh, and then they, they you know, basically get transported to Singapore Expo here. Connected Changi is, is one part of Singapore Expo's larger facilities. Uh, and then, you know, as, as they are within the facility, they're in the bubble, they are secure. There are all kinds of technologies that we use to make sure that they're secure. And uh, when they check out, they safely check out and return back from where they came. Right? So it's, it's basically part of that whole, whole process of uh, journey management. Yeah, and I think uh, full, you know, amazing credit to 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 Singex, uh, Sphere, and, and your other partners in, in Connected Changi. Uh, I have a lot of my uh, my business colleagues from overseas pinging me on, you know, what a fantastic job Singapore is doing, kind of adapting to to this pandemic. Uh, I only hope that that everyone who visits gets gets the good food, right? Like I'd be pretty disappointed if I flew all the way to <laughs> Singapore and didn't get some some nice bat or me or you know something like this. So. I hope the food's good so they get the whole experience. The food is excellent and I invite everyone here, all of, all of you in the panel and attendees who are, who are uh, right now uh, seeing us and you know, watching us and listening to us to come and experience the, the, the food at uh, Connected Champion. Nice, <laughs> I'll take you up on that. Hey, so uh, I, I wanna go to you, Christine. Uh, I think you, know, you have this fascinating role and, and you and I have talked a little bit about uh, your, your views on this, but you have this fascinating role that's super forward looking, right? Um, so you must see these kind of different scenarios, I guess, that could play out in the future. What's your thoughts generally? Like, you know, you must have a thousand people asking you about, hey, what's going to happen in the future and all of that. There's no one answer, I don't think, for this, but, but what's your thoughts on, on, on how you kind of see mobility, mobility and travel playing out in, in the next kind of year or two? Sure, Simon. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, indeed, I cannot look into the future. I don't know what's going to happen. But um, I want to talk a little bit about maybe some convictions. And I want to start with this 
picture. Um, the picture is Sleeping Beauty. Uh, you guys probably have heard about that fairy tale. And I think in a way we see the travel industry as Sleeping Beauty, as some as, as the princess uh, being sleeping and, and we're just waiting for her to, to wake up. And I think there's another conviction here, which is so long as we human beings live, so long will there be trouble, right? Because I think by now, I'm sure if ever, any any borders would lift their restrictions, we would be traveling like there's no tomorrow, right? And it really doesn't matter that there's a virus out there. So the innate need for people to connect and to travel is so much bigger than the fear of catching a virus or, you know, kind of being okay with, with taking that risk. And I think because of those two images, I think I, th I, th I look very hopeful to traveling coming back. Um, I think when I think about Sleeping Beauty or maybe uh, another equivalent uh, picture of that is a coma patient, is we know the coma patient will not die. We just simply don't know when that patient is going to wake up. And I think what is more important is that we just don't simply know how this patient will wake up because there might be completely different types of behaviors arising. And I think when I think about the post-pandemic wor world, I think about three different dimensions. The first is I think it's not really a travel or hospitality problem. It already starts with how do we open up schools, right? Like how do we actually make sure that when more than two, 10 people meet, how do we make sure that a concert can actually happen again? Do we not all feel a little bit funny when we go to a party and it, you know, it's the first time that we see so many people around again? Like, is there not a chance, and this is kind of like where we're coming from, from that more broader um, scope, is there not a chance to actually connect with other industries that actually face the same type of problems that are not really travel related? They're just simply about how do we, how do we ensure that more parties can actually meet? And perhaps this is, this is a good source to think about different new solutions. The second thing I think about is the, the way we react to it. Is it reactive or is it active? And my impression is that current, the current discussions about how travel can got, come back are all very reactive. And I wonder whether there is a chance where we can actually think about, okay, if we had to rethink travel and hospitality, like how would it look like in the 21st century? How would it look like with all the different tools and, and technologies that are available to us? Will it actually look very differently? Because right now we are reactively thinking about health passports. We're thinking about ways to make sure that people regain confidence to travel again. But is there not something else that we can actually make the whole travel experience much more seamless or interesting or exciting. And then last but not least, I think the third thing that I think about, and this is more in, in the travel and aviation context, is how does leisure versus business travel come back? And I'm sure everyone's been thinking about business travel because it's such a ch big chunk of the business. And also here, we've done our studies, we've talked to a lot of experts, we kind of like consolidated that type of learning. And um, the conclusion out of it is, and, and we really look into China for that quite a bit, is that we realize that there's this digital acceleration and perhaps not that much has changed in the way we want to connect to our business partners, the way we want to, you know, uh, build trust. And that perhaps the key learning is, is really to take those different dimensions and start having these conversations around okay, if we wanted to, you know, blank sheet, think about travel, how would we actually do that? And this is just, you know, pushing it back to the panel panel discussion here and see what people think about that. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a super, super interesting area. Um, and it, it will be interesting to see kind of the different models that come out of this. Uh, so so maybe we can hold like a, another panel in a year and kind of review actually what's happened. Because I, I, I think, there will be some unforeseen changes that happen, uh, and and some very very foreseen ones. Uh, you know, I think uh, I think safety and assurance is something that that everyone's talked about today, and it's going to be at the heart of what happens. Christine, I think on your first point of kind of going, you mentioned going to these parties and being kind of surprised by the amount of people. Uh, I was I was lucky enough to to return to uh, New Zealand, where I'm from, for for Christmas to see my family, and uh, and I, I just you know it was. 
incredible and also anxiety inducing, I think a little bit, just seeing 10,000 people in a single place or something like this, you know, no masks, no COVID-19 in New Zealand, not a care in the world. It's going to take, it's going to take people, uh, especially in some of the areas that have been really hard hit a long time to kind of recover. And I think, you know, it won't go back to, to exactly what it was. Things will change, uh, but what things they are. Mm -hmm. I think I think this is you know coming back to the analogy of a fairy tale. The question is like, what is the morale out of it, right? Is it about just like kind of putting a patch onto these like different challenges, or is there a way to to think differently about it? And and the reason I stress this point is because we we tend to always want to compare, and our benchmark here is pre COVID twenty nineteen, right? But do we will we ever come back to that level of revenue, the level of like activities, or will it just be different? Will we find other value pools that are, you know, outside of the, the, the traditional business one? I think those are the questions to ask. Yeah, totally. I, I agree with you. Um, so I, I, I kind of want to, you know, we've, we've, we've done a fantastic job, I think, setting the scene. Uh, and I want to steer this towards, uh, towards what, what we do want to talk about a little bit, which is kind of how deep tech can help this. Um, so, so Zhang Wei, I, I want to talk to you for just for a moment. Uh, we all three panelists, I think, have talked about safety and assurance is, is a critical component in whatever scenario or scenarios kind of come to pass. And I think uh, out of all the panelists, Zhang Wei, you've had a lot of interaction, I guess, with with healthcare partners and governments and ministries on how they're thinking um, and the kind of challenges that they've had. Maybe you can share a little bit on this. Yeah. Um... You know, Credify really started in the entire healthcare scenario early 2020 when the pandemic just came. So we were approached by the Ministry of Health with a very specific use case in mind. I'm sure those in Singapore, you should remember that um, back then we had a foreign worker dormitory outbreak, right? So a huge number of foreign workers actually were contracted the COVID-19 virus. Um, then back then, uh, the biggest issue was that when they recovered and they want to go back to their workforce or their dormitory, they had to bring along with them a physical piece of paper. And then with that physical piece of paper, that actually tells you that I'm safe to come back. Given the consequence and the impact of um, a false positive, you can imagine how scary that the entire system is. So we kind of stepped in. Um, we started becoming the bridge, you know, again, a bridge of secure healthcare data sharing, taking the discharge memos, Discharge memo for those in the audience, um, basically it shows that you, you contracted. And then the, the impact of it is that it has sort of an implied immunity, right? After you have the antibodies in the system. So with that discharge memo, we make it into a verifiable document that any employer or dormitory owner, they can just cross check against the Ministry of Manpower. So in the last seven to eight months that we have implemented this, we have crossed five million verifications across different use cases. It could be, you know, going back to the dormitory, reporting for work at a construction site, whatsoever. So that 5 million verifications could have been um, an email or a phone call to, to the facilities. That'd be a huge nightmare. And I'm sharing that because, um, you know, we hear a lot from Vijay, Christine and Riz that um, I feel that there's a lot of pressure put onto the airlines and the airports um, and the travel industry. But if we were to take a step back and, and look at this, is this really a healthcare problem or a travel problem, right? So back at how Christine looked at it, um, imagine if you think about not just air travel, but also land travel and sea travel. And then beyond that, if you arrive at the, the, the other destination, how do you go into the stadium? How do you go into the club, the restaurants? that entire process, then you cannot see it as a travel problem anymore. So, you know, I, I've been asked, is it a travel or health problem? If I were to put uh, um, a fix on it, I think it's a healthcare problem that is huge, you know, impact in the travel industry. That's my sharing, Simon. Yeah, thank you. I think that that's such a such an interesting perspective, uh, and I guess it's a it's a healthcare problem and it's an assurance problem. And and if you solve these, I guess you can go some way to enabling um, your partners in the in the travel industry or or the event industry or uh, colleges and universities, which, whichever kind of partners you might have, to provide that that safety and assurance for for whatever scenario that they are planning out. 
Um, so, so that's super interesting. I think VJ, you know, with this as kind of a backdrop, we, you know, Christine talks about these different scenarios for, for travel. Um, what do you see happening in kind of the, the next three months, the next six months, the next nine months? You know, I think we're all eager. I, I myself would love to jump on a plane and, and, and head somewhere to go for a holiday. We're all eager for this, but what do you really see playing out? No, I, I echo the thoughts from uh, some of our other panelists, and I like uh, what Christine mentioned about the sleeping beauty ready to, ready to come back, right, awake again. So, um, you know, when you look at this as a broader scale, uh, experts believe that we are in the primary phase of COVID-19 now. We will probably move to the intermediate phase next year and to a post-COVID phase by the end of 2023 or the beginning of 2024. So that's the timeline that we are looking at. But clearly, we can't wait that long, right? So our vaccination is key to reviving travel and the economy. And I believe we are in early stages of vaccination, although several countries plan to get majority of their citizens vaccinated, possibly by end of this year. So vaccination, along with international standards and safe travel protocols, will help open borders quickly and facilitate travel. So creating that safe environment is key, not only for travel, but like our other panelists mentioned, and especially Zengwei mentioned just now, it's related to all the other activities of travel too. You travel for a specific purpose, so the travel is related to a whole ecosystem around that as well. So we do anticipate that those who are vaccinated should be able to travel more easily, possibly with a digital health pass type solution, while the non-vaccinated or the unvaccinated passengers might still have to take a PCR test two days or three days before departure, and they might still have to additionally take an antigen test before departure and on arrival as well. Um, you know, so that's going to be the hardships that we'll experience over the next one or two years as the vaccination kicks in. And, uh, you know, but on a lighter note, right, I know that most people are ready to travel as soon as the borders are open, especially here in Singapore and uh, Hong Kong markets and others where we don't have any domestic travel here, right, even in the UAE. Uh, you know, I hear comments from uh, some of my colleagues like, I miss the middle seat, I miss the boarding queue. Uh, and, and one guy mentioned to me this morning that uh, he misses quality time at the baggage claim area. Can you believe that? Uh, <laughs> so some of these comments came from my colleagues. So most frequent destinations last year was not SFO or LHR or SAN, which is Singapore. It was DNG, the dining room, LVG, the living room, or the master bedroom, the MPR, or the home office, H HMO, right? So people hey. clearly, <laughs> people clearly want to start traveling again after being confined for so long. I, I really believe that the airlines will initially rely on leisure travel. I think Christine mentioned that as well, because business travel, in my opinion as well, will not recover very, very quickly. So if you hear from some of the travel analysts, they do say that we would never get back to pre-COVID levels. But I, I have a different view on that because we need to be optimistic given the population and the rise in spending across uh, the broader Asia Pacific, Africa, and other parts of the world as well. So if I remember correctly, I think there was a forecast from IATA before COVID that the world passenger traffic will increase from 3.2 billion passengers to in 2018 to 7 billion by 2030 and possibly cross 8 billion by 2037. So we might get somewhere close enough to that as well. So we do expect travel to restart, um, especially here uh, after the World Economic Forum in Singapore, which, uh, which the whole world is waiting for. That's scheduled in August this year. It was initially planned in May and moved to August. Uh, most airlines and travel companies that we talk to are actually planning to reinstate flights in a gradual manner from Q4. Um, you know, some of you know that we also have Dubai Expo scheduled to kick off in the month of October and the Middle East carriers, especially Emirates and others are working towards that as well. And then of course we have Tokyo Olympics that's going to kick off on the 23rd of June although with local spectators, uh, you know, to, to initially start with. So all these events, in addition to the vaccination program, will actually help in travel restarting in Q4. We'll see some increased travel in 2022 next year and possibly to a good level of recovery by 2023. Mm. 
And, and I think this is also in line with what we hear from the markets and various governments, right? So the UK announced that they are planning to reinstate international travel from the mid of May, subject to certain task force reports, but they are planning towards that. Thailand has announced that they'll open up tourism by October. Yesterday, the Minister of Tourism said that they need to in fact bring the date forward to July and open up at least three different uh, island destinations like Phuket and Krabi and others that brings 20% of revenues into Thailand. So they are thinking of bringing the dates forward. Seychelles actually uh, announced that they're gonna open from uh, the 25th of March with no vaccination required, but just a PCR test, but on arrival, they are free to move around. Mm. Right? And, and uh, you said you're from uh, New Zealand, so good to hear that. So yeah, New Zealand already resumed quarantine free flights from Sydney to Melbourne last week, and they plan to connect to Brisbane this week as well. Qantas has announced uh, international flights from October. You did mention about the travel bubble that Singapore, Australia is planning and uh, possibly with New Zealand as well. So I think, I think in my view, things are looking up for a possible restart in Q4, but safety is going to be the top priority for all travelers. Yeah, and, and I, I, I thank you for that, VJ. I, I, Briz, I presume safety is kind of going to be one of these uh, important factors when you look at restarting physical events and things like that as well. What kind of uh, what kind of technologies and, and, and things in your toolbox are you looking at to kind of provide that assurance to attendees? So I think to start with, it's oh, going sorry, to sorry, VJ. I want to I want to uh, arrow Riz with that. Oh, okay. Got it, got it, got it. <laughs> okay. The arrow's pointing towards me now. Okay. All that's right. Now, a... uh, okay. Um, okay. That, now, that's actually a, a, a great question. Yeah. So, uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, of course, you know, ensuring that we at, uh, at all points in time in this new uh, emerging post pandemic world, right, we make sure that our visitors to uh, Singapore Expo are safe and secure uh, is, uh, is, I mean, it, it, it is a given now, right? So mm. we, we cannot compromise on that anymore. That's a baseline to start any uh, uh, conversation around, uh, uh, around hosting and managing events, right? Uh, so for, uh, for us, uh, that, that, that means that, you know, we've kind of looked at the, uh, uh, the, the visitor experience as an end-to-end -end customer journey. Actually, we've been doing it for a very, very long time. But now we had to, or the best way to say this, we had to redesign that journey a little bit and build in elements of safety, functionality, and security into that whole journey, right? Uh, so so uh, the journey actually starts from the time or from the moment that a visitor checks into the, into the premise or into the facility, right? So the first point, part of that is essentially a check-in. Sometimes it can be, and without getting into a lot of detail here, uh, it can be a, a part of a process of registering with a collection of, of uh, uh, data within the, obviously, the, uh, uh, the right uh, privacy uh, uh, construct. Uh, and sometimes it's just about showing up and uh, uh, doing, doing, doing a quick and easy check-in, right? It li literally starts there. And then from that point, as they traverse through the facility, uh, uh, you know, they could be doing multiple things. They could be attending a specific event, you know, uh, 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 attending uh, uh, certain speaker sessions, or they could be interacting with other visitors, uh, or they could be consuming services from our partners, right? A lot of them are FNB outlets here, restaurants, etc. There's a whole bunch of things going on, right? So at, at every point of this journey, uh, we are using uh, actually a whole host of technologies. So what we're doing is we're using Obviously, one part of what we're doing is we're leveraging a lot of technology that the government already provides, right? And that since I think the Singapore government is way more advanced uh, uh, in the way it thinks about it, it has thought about this whole journey, right? Uh, in this in this new operating environment, right? So, so we are trying to tap into a whole bunch of uh, open APIs and and services that the government provides. So, for example, we are in exploration as an as an example. Uh, 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 with with uh, different government agencies to see how we can tap into services around that are already being provided by Trace Together and Safe Entry before, right? Because uh, you know there, there there is a process of check-in. It also goes back to how seamless can you keep it without complicating the whole all, the whole process of, uh, of of capturing information and keeping visitors secure. Uh, so so one part of it is you know just working with the ecosystem. The other part of what we do is uh, when they are in the facility, uh, we you know, we obviously have our infrastructure and services, especially our Wi-Fi network, right? 
which has the ability to actually at different levels of resolution uh, track uh, visitors in the facility, right? So what we're doing is we've kind of reconfigured that whole network uh, to now essentially set different kinds of thresholds. So we can control the number of people, who, for example, get together at a, who uh, uh, congregate in a certain point. Uh, we can also use it to basically create cohorts, right? Because one of the things that we're doing now with social distancing is that we are basically uh, uh, um, uh, ensuring that people are in cohorts and that these cohorts don't mix with each other, right? And then there's a lot of phasing out and distance, other distancing measures in place. So it's a combination of, uh, of, of some of these uh, Wi-Fi and network technologies tapping into the eco, uh, uh, in, into the already available ecosystem. Uh, and in the back end, there's a whole bunch of analytics. And I made this point before, right? So I think what is of great interest to us as well, we're also keeping people secure, which is our primary responsibility here. Uh, the data that we capture in the back end helps us to drive many different kinds of insights. Right? And those insights are being used to create, uh, you know, they're basically leading to opportunities and creating business models that we didn't thought, uh, so I'm sorry, we didn't think existed before, right? Uh, so there are new possibilities now, right? Uh, 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 for example, uh, we are clearly seeing that when we work with many of our partners, right, uh, uh, be it you know, airlines, uh, be it hotels, uh, uh, be it some of the uh, the other partners who are in the, in the leisure business, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, the, uh, the 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 potential to create new types of services and to literally uh, create a new kinds of user experiences have actually increased many 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 fold. So you know there 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 are opportunities right now. Yeah, I, and I think that it's, it's going to be so interesting that the different tools, I guess, that you have, Riz, uh, and I guess, you know, a little bit about what Zhang Wei was talking about must resonate with you as well, right? It shouldn't yeah. shouldn't be a, uh, an operator, an event organizer or operator's responsibility to ensure healthcare things, but you need to figure a way um, to work that into your flow in, in, a, in a way that doesn't create a lot of friction, but provides the safety and assurance to, to these attendees. Yeah, absolutely. No, actually, the point, I think the point that uh, that, that uh, Zhang Wei made was uh, was a uh, was an ex it's an extremely important consideration for someone like us who is I think we see ourselves as a, as one of the key partners in this whole travel ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, so so therefore, uh, um, uh, we are more than interested, as I said, uh, in tapping into uh, all the different. Uh, uh, potential technologies out there, right? That can make it easy to track uh, uh, visitors in this country, right? So they are basically consuming a whole bunch of services. So it's the whole model of having a single customer ID in some sense. Right? Yeah. And as we make it easy, therefore, there's the yeah, back to the point that you made about the you know sharing and interoperability uh, is I think very critical here. And we, we you know I think that that's that's the model that we are going towards, and we would like to be very participative in that mm. process with many many different parts. Yeah, I think it's going to be, it's a nice little fit for everyone to, to kind of provide benefit to, to the stakeholders. Uh, Zhang Wei, you know, we've kind of talked a little bit about this, the, the digital health passport that, that Accreditify have. For the audience, can you kind of break down uh, a little bit about, you know, what you're actually doing? Um, why, why, why is it that you have to do this in the first place? Sure. Um, you know, after hearing from all the panelists, right, I, I would like to put forth this concept that everybody can 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 just think about, um, look at the concept of risk level versus risk appetite. If you look at VJ, Christine, reads everything that they have talked about is their risk appetite, right? As an airplane, as a mice event, what is my risk appetite? I want someone that has been vaccinated. I want someone that has been vaccinated and just taken a PCR test and whatsoever, right? So our job here is really matching risk appetite and risk level. You know, the digital health passport and the different healthcare providers that we work with simply allow us the ability to set the risk level of an individual in a verified manner. So for example, in Singapore, we work with 400 over clinics and hospitals and laboratories. If you go for a test, you get a verifiable test result. Or in the future for a vaccine, you get a vaccination record. And then I can match your risk level with whichever risk appetite the receiving party is comfortable with. So in that sense, you know, in order to match that, if you look at it, uh, today we, we have so many labs, so many manufacturers, so many test kits, so many clinics and so many hospitals. How can we actually aggregate all this data if everybody is free to, you know, 
issue any kind of credentials or test results or vaccination, you know, paper certificate as they wish. It's going to be very tough. Um, and then that, that's where we come in, right? We designed a data schema that standardized um, COVID-19 test results across Singapore. And then we're also working with IBM on their Health Pass initiative, which, which allow us to have interoperability between these different systems. So the, the whole idea is that at the, at the end of the day, um, the process, no matter how good you have done the test or how good the vaccination is, um, it has to be matched with a, a mode of delivery like ours, right? If you trust Parkway Pentai on the test, if you trust um, Raffles Medical on the test, if you trust a Pfizer vaccination, we are the mode of delivery to let you know that this person indeed have been vaccinated with a, with a Pfizer vaccine, um, taken a test at Raffles Medical or Parkway Pantai, and eventually that risk level can match this, you know, someone that like risk, you know, whatever is your risk appetite. Mm. I guess with that assurance, because really, you know, when I look at this, you're providing assurance to your customer who maybe is an event organizer or a government or customs, whoever that is, that the document that that person presenting is, is actually truthful and, and it hasn't been uh, edited or, or uh, changed in some way, right? So it's that assurance. And I guess if I'm a government and you can give me that assurance, then it allows me to be a bit more flexible in the policies that I create for, for this this individual. Maybe in a travel sense, that could be, um, you know, being able to skip quarantine or something like this, right? Like if I if I know that someone has, has guaranteed had the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, then I'm okay with them uh, not being quarantined onto entry perhaps. Uh, and I, I think uh, I think uh, that that's a huge, a huge lever that 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 governments and that organizations and events and, and airlines can can pull on um, provides assurance to to the other people in that ecosystem um, but does kind of justify this flexible policy which will be critical in, in getting things going again christine i I'm, I'm sure that your group has kind of looked at technologies like this um, and and i know that you like to do a, a kind of a lot of research with the customers to understand you know how they think about um perhaps different implementations of, of technology um, that might come about. What are the kind of challenges or, or potential uh, kind of pushbacks that you might see from, from the general public when, when they talk about, you know, having to show a medical record to travel and things like that? Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. I, I want to react to what Zhongwei just, uh, just uh, said, and I would like to challenge it and take a step back maybe because you know, I've, I've thought about blockchain, I've been thinking about self-identity, KYC, all of the good stuff, right? But I think what I'm wondering is like, what is the problem we're trying to solve here, right? And when I think about safety, I think about people feeling okay to go onto a trip again, right? That That's the kind of safety we're talking about. We're not talking necessarily about the safety of, of records and documents and identity. That's not something that I would say the end consumer really cares about, right? They just want to travel safely. So I, I would say that my, my opinion on that is twofold. I think, I actually think that we haven't really figured out the basics to be very honest and frank. Um, and I see this with Europe, right? And, and the whole, uh, well, perceived chaos on like um, different vaccination policies in different EU countries and 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 their like supply chain uh, problems. There, you know, it, it's just very chaotic. And I I almost want to say that before we think about deep tech and we think about like different technologies being applied to this problem, it's almost like we have to start with the basics. We have to start with the basics that everyone can get vaccinated in a, in a manner that uh, is, is safe and, and good. And so it's actually coming back to what Jung was saying before that it's probably a healthcare problem rather than a travel problem, right? And then I always think about the application of more security, which is essentially blockchain or you know verifications that's like in, in my opinion a second step it really comes after you know once we have hopefully everyone vaccinated that those type of problems uh, will arise or can be tackled right but i feel like i feel like we need to start with the basics to be honest yeah and look i mean i i wouldn't necessarily argue against you either i think there's this this 
terrible toss up that that a lot of uh, the world is making in terms of, you know, we, I think COVID's going to have a long tail and it's going to take a long time to get vaccinations in the hands of a lot of people that need it around the world. There, there's some, uh, you know, amazing efforts that are that are being conducted on that front, but there needs to be more for sure. But my question maybe to Zhang Wei and then to you, Christine, is do we have the time to wait? You know, can, can we wait two years for that to happen or three years for that to happen? Uh, I, I would argue that there probably needs to be some sort of intermediary in this. Yeah, I mean, maybe uh, just to react to that quickly, um, definitely. And I think health passports, whether Europeans like it or not, or GDPR, uh, you know, regulations like it or not, I think this will come just simply because other uh, parts of the world uh, are actually adapting to similar models. And um, I think eventually we'll see this in the short term that people will will have to prove or show some health data and in order to like safely travel in and out. But I think my, my broader point is that um, at least for an end consumer perspective, whether this lives on a blockchain or not is is not really relevant to them, right? It's just about like, is it is it convenient and to understand if I were to like travel to Dubai now, like what what is it that I need to do in order to like mm. be able to enter? Those are the questions that are on on top of mind, not whether it's safely secured with some government uh, database. Zhang Wei, what's your comments on that? Um, I, I really agree with Christine and that timing is the most important. So if you look at um, different, um, just different documents that we have issued in the past year, right? You can see that when pandemic came in early 2020, January, we only started issuing the charge memo in June and July, 2020. Because that's what Christine have said. Everybody is focused on getting the right infrastructure in place, making sure that whomever contracts with um, COVID-19 has a safe place to stay for their quarantine before they get out. And then again, when you know travel start to open with PCR tests somewhere around June, we didn't straight away go into a issuance of uh, COVID-19 test results. We only started a full progress just um, early this month um, you know, on 10th of March where we did a nationwide rollout in Singapore. Again, there's a six to nine months wait there because everybody is getting that in place, making sure that healthcare providers are able to you know, administer the swap, the laboratories are ready. So we can see that vaccination has come, you know, three months, and as Simon, you're just saying now is the three months, um, money, month, month versary, right? So three months now, okay, maybe in the next uh, three to six months, a digital health pass for vaccination record is not critical because the infrastructure is still there to get it in place. But what we have now is, you know, the know-how as well as the experience that we had deploying a scale with the charge memos and COVID-19 test results. We are ready for vaccination record. So when that timing comes, like Christine said, when everybody gets their basic need, and then we are here to work with people like VJ, people like Reese, uh, and Christine's and uh, Lufthansa to get people to travel again. So I just completely agree with what. VJ Rizwan, any comments yeah. on this? I, I, I know we're running sure. really close to the end. So so if you have yeah. anything, please please share it with us. Sure. Okay, maybe. Can, uh, oh, go ahead. Okay. I can add some very quick comments on this, right? So <laughs> Rich touched upon interoperability, and I also agree with uh, Christine and Zengwei on their thoughts as well. But you know, everything is moving at the same speed, uh, you know, very, very fast speed rather, uh, yeah. at the same time to converge together. So I think managing pre-trip is also equally important as the travel itself. You know, everyone needs to be prepared and well informed at all times. Uh, you know, for example, it's not just about uh, having the vaccine information in hand. It's about knowing what type of test and COVID test requirements you need to take and what kind of COVID vaccination certificates you need to carry, the arrival declarations. The quarantine rules keep changing in many countries at very short notice. The airport transit rules, you know, the track and trace forms that we need to fill up. There is so many things that we need to look at. And all of those comes to place through the digital health pass type initiatives. And uh, this is going to be there for a while. The COVID test and verification will continue. Uh, as part of the travel, aviation, safety protocols, and it's not going to go away. So therefore, the standardization is going to be very, very important. The digital mobile solution will allow passengers to verify their identity through their health status by storing the results of COVID test or the digital vaccination records and avoid carrying multiple digital wallets and all those things. There's many airlines and travel companies that are doing trials today. 
obviously, you know, we need clarity on interoperability and have a global standard in order to make this rollout very, very successful. This is one of the key reasons I think IBM and Accreditify are partnering so that the same solution can be used across industries and avoid multiple wallets at any given point in time. You know, um, there are many things that we can standardize. For example, IATA has been running with thematic, which is the travel information manual since 1963, that usually stores data like visa, passport information. Now they are adding the COVID-19 arrival requirements as well. So we can leverage that, you know, any solution provider can leverage that and, and keep that as a base. Uh, I don't think the problems that all of us discussed today can be sorted out by one airline or a one government or, uh, you know, one company on its own. You know, that's why I think many of these companies, including organizations in the technology side, uh, travel side and healthcare side are coming together, you know, through the uh, Good Health Pass collaboration. Some of you might know about it, ID 2020 launched this last month with about 80 participants, which includes IBM, some of our travel partners like Amadeus, CETA, Airport Council International, uh, MasterCard and so on. And you know they are working towards getting to a global blueprint for managing the digital health pass systems, just to ensure that it's all interoperable. I think that would be very yeah. key. I agree. I, yeah. I, so the US government uh, has also been approached by this group yesterday to get the relevant guidance so we can make this rollout on a global scale as well. So I think interoperability, open standards and trust are the key to adoption and to revive travel and get back to normal as quickly as possible. Yeah, I totally agree, BJ. And I think uh, no one cares if it's on the blockchain as long as it's frictionless, provides assurance and gets people into, you know, on, on their holiday or something like that. Riz, any any quick comments to, to wrap this up from you? Uh, sure, maybe a very quick one. So I, I wanted to say that I think Christine uh, has, has brought a very insightful perspective to this discussion. And I don't think there's an easy answer to this one, uh, but I can share what we are experiencing here on the ground, right? Uh, as, as, as a venue manager, right? So I think at this point in time, and Christine, uh, uh, and, you know, I think she said that uh, said, said said this absolutely in in, in in the in the right context. People are very very concerned about the health, and right now, if they had to make a choice between health and securing the data, it is primarily about making sure that they are you know that their health uh, is uh, uh, is taken care of at every point in time as they work with different agencies and governments or companies, right? Uh, but that said, uh, I think. There is a concern with data, for sure. And we, we see that on the ground, right? And I think the concern here is not so much about providing the data, but about making sure that the custodian that is managing this data is trustworthy. So there is a very big question of trust, you know, because what's happening right now is that there is a lot of very, very personal data that is being shared, right? And is required at this point in time, right? As people de deal with this health crisis. Uh, but I think from a slightly longer term perspective, there will be ethical questions about what you do with my data, right? There are governments that are collecting data. There are many different organizations, you know, we spoke about it, ecosystem partners who are collecting data, right? So again and again, uh, many of our stakeholders and customers are asking questions about, you know, uh, is it a trustworthy source? Do you mm -hmm. manage and handle my data well? Can you, and can you, can you, you know, uh, ensure that uh, uh, if I ask you to, delete my data or to purge my data, you will do it in the, in, in the, in the most uh, uh, ethical manner possible, right? So there are some, some questions out there. Uh, yeah. And I think there is, there is, there is a balance somewhere. Uh, so, so just wanted to make that point. No, uh, I, I point agree. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you, you get around, we solve a lot of these problems if you can park that data with the individual so that they're in control of it. It doesn't go anywhere else and, and it's their choice to do what they want with it. But look, uh, I, it, it's, it's almost five past. So I, I, apologies for keeping you too long. I think it's been a fantastic event. Thank you so much for coming. If we could give you a whole bunch of applause, I absolutely would. But I, I just want to finish. So thank you very much. Uh, I want uh, I want you, if you don't mind, to share first leisure trip uh, as soon as you can. When, when things get, get when things get back going, where are you all going to go? For me. Uh, I think, uh, I think I would like to go back to New Zealand and, uh, and spend some time out on a boat, uh, maybe going for some fishing. BJ, where are you off to? I'll come out to New Zealand as well. I like that. Uh, you, can, <laughs> you can stay with me. Christine? 
I, I really like virtual backgrounds because people can't tell where I am, but I'm currently in Dubai. Uh, ah. So I, I, I escaped a little bit uh, the, the grueling gray Berlin days, um, but remote working. Love it. <laughs> Riz? Uh, I will most probably be heading out on a cruise to nowhere. <laughs> 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 which, Enjoy which, it. which, which uh, I think uh, uh, you know. Luckily, I'm in Singapore, and I, I had the luxury of getting on that cruise. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Zhang Wei, where, where's your first holiday off to? I'll be at a beach somewhere in Maldives, perhaps. Love it. <laughs> hey, thank you so much to 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 all of you, VJ, Christine, Riz, and Zhang Wei. Uh, been a fantastic event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, and to our panel you, of speakers Bob. for the great sharing. And thank you to everyone for your ongoing questions. It's always thank very you. heartening to see so much enthusiasm at our sessions. Um, but real conversations often happen after, so we do hope that all of you can keep connected. Um, the recording of this session will also be uploaded on SG Nubet's YouTube channel. So do head on there for a review of today's event and to our next online event. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you.